Well, good afternoon, and thank you so much for joining us. <laughs> um, and we're delighted to have any support. If you've attended one of our lectures before, and I know you have many times, uh, you know the Rutgers Enrichment Program was founded by Maureen and Michael Rutgers in 1999 in gratitude to the teachers and administration who had supported their three children. Their vision was to provide financial support that would enable CCHS staff to share their ideas on subjects about which they feel great passion. Today's presenter, Dr. David Nuremberg, joined the CCHS English Department in the fall of 2000. Along with his position as English teacher, Dr. Nuremberg has played many roles at Concord Carlisle High School. A few among them include longtime faculty advisor to the Sci-Fi Club, coordinator of the NCTE Writing Competition, and coordinator of our exchange program with our sister city in Nanai, Japan. Dr. Nuremberg is also a professor at Lesley University, teaching in the education department, and we are delighted that he's speaking today. Uh, thank you, and thank you guys for coming today. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to speak as if there's a larger group of people here, but um, please, since we are such a, a, a nice and intimate group, if you want to throw up hands and add things and go off on a tangent, I'm very happy and accommodating uh, with that. And uh, again, I want to thank the uh, Rutgers uh, Foundation program for uh, enabling these sorts of events. And I want to thank Dr. Lepret for coordinating and for organizing and for bringing food. Uh, so the title of this presentation is, but I thought we fixed this in the 60s. Why are schools still segregated? And the genesis of this talk uh, really came after a particular event here at the school where uh, we had an absolutely wonderful uh, actor come to campus to play Thurgood Marshall, the first African-American Supreme Court Justice. And the play was engaging and dramatic. Um, it is rare that you get a whole auditorium full of students who are not looking at their phones. They were that captivated, and we had a, uh, an advisory prior to sort of give us background. Um, the frustrating part for me, though, was that the narrative, both within the play and within the advisory, ended with the Brown decision, which certainly was one of the high points of uh, Justice Marshall's career, uh, certainly was a very important uh, landmark in American history, but it also felt to me like the equivalent of studying European history and ending with, <laughs> and then the Allies defeated Kaiser Wilhelm, making Europe safe from tyranny and war. It was certainly a moment in time, but to end there, of course, would uh, elide a great deal of history that transformed, uh, in this case, the face of Europe, and that also included a great deal of, of suffering. And not that I'm necessarily equating those two, but uh, the point of this presentation is that when we think about Brown versus the Board of Education as the victory that ends the narrative of school segregation, that's both inaccurate and I would argue irresponsible. Um, first, the inaccurate. Uh, most of the gains in uh, desegregation were either limited or reversed uh, over the intervening time since Brown. And if you look at the picture of schooling today, you'll see our schools are still extraordinarily segregated. Uh, if you are a white student, on average, you are in a school that is 73% white. If you're an African-American student, you're on the average in a school that is 50% African-American. Um, and in Boston, uh, in the Massachusetts area, much higher. Um, and if you're Latino, uh, you are in a school that is majority Latino. So, if this is the picture today, something clearly happened between Brown and 2019. Um, today, half of black students attend schools with an 80% or more minority student body. Uh, despite the fact that white students vastly outnumber African American students in American schools, at no point in US history have more than 50% of African American students attended schools with a majority of whites in the student body. We have the phenomenon of so-called apartheid schools, schools with fewer than 1% white students. 
And those schools have more than doubled since 1988. When you turn it around and look at white students attending majority white schools, this is from 2011-2012, uh, you'll find that segregation is quite strong, except in the South. Um, this is a picture that does not seem to support a narrative that the end of segregation came with, or the end of school segregation, rather, came with the Brown decision. Um, in fact, the state with the most segregated schools in the US is New York. Uh, according to the Civil Rights Project at Harvard, and this was in 2016, the proportion of black students at majority white schools is now at a level lower than in any year uh, since 1968. So if that's the inaccurate, um, I want to bring my personal experience into this is when, because I don't want to unfairly single out Concord Carlisle as propagating this narrative. I think this is a narrative that at least as a white person I've seen in my own schooling, I've seen the schooling of my children, and I've seen in popular culture writ large. Um, and that is that de, de jure segregation, segregation through law, that somehow ended with the Civil Rights Act. And now that segregation which still exists is considered de facto, based on some series of personal choices and unwritten laws and unwritten social compacts. Um, and indeed, I've heard students here, uh, white students, say things when we read To Kill a Mockingbird or A Song of Solomon to the effect that, well, segregation used to be legally enforced, now people choose to be with people who look like them. And I think that's the danger, that we have not only an inaccurate, but I think an irresponsible situation if Brown marks the end of the idea of legal separation in schools um, in our mindset, in our consciousness. Um, and so my argument today is that school segregation today is not de facto. It is not based on unwritten laws. Rather, it's the product of past and present legal decisions and legislative measures. And I think that's important because if we have this narrative where uh, School segregation is not the product of legislation and political solutions, then there is no political solution or legislative solution out of it. But if we construct this understanding, I think more accurately, that our present situation is the result in large part of certain legislative and judicial decisions, then that opens up the possibilities of legislative and judicial remedies. And that changes the game of our conversation about school segregation. Uh, so, my agenda here is as follows. We just kind of introduced that situation. Uh, I want to review a couple of key court decisions um, and legislation that attempted desegregation. Um, then going to take you through the successful pushback against desegregation, particularly in the North. Uh, we'll take 12 minutes out to watch some footage from Boston, just because it hits much closer to home for our audience here. Um, We'll talk about the final nails in integration's coffin uh, that came starting in the 70s, um, continued through the 90s and into the early 2000s. And then, not to end on a downer, um, perhaps some possible ways forward. Um, if we want to indeed make reality the narrative that somehow segregation in, in schools has ended. Uh, so first, a little bit of history, right? 1896, Plessy versus Ferguson establishes uh, the principle that separate but equal is um, a doctrine by which American uh, race-based law will focus. And that was the particular doctrine that was challenged when Oliver Brown filed a class action suit against the Board of Education of Topeka, Kansas. Um, it was challenged on the grounds of the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment that there is something inherently unequal about this separation, that separate but equal uh, is not a sustainable doctrine. And uh, the first he takes it to the district court in Kansas, which agrees that school segregation has a detrimental effect upon students of color um, and promotes a sense of inferiority, but then still upholds the law. And so Brown's case gets packaged with four others and gets taken to the Supreme Court. And that's where we have that decision uh, for which Justice Marshall, among others, are very famous. Um, it's a unanimous nine to zero decision that segregated schools are inherently unequal. And a key piece of that is the court rejected 
arguments that somehow just increasing the funding and the resources for what were then called Negro schools would solve the problem. The court decided that no, it is the very separation by race that is the problem and that leads to the damage. So it's not just a matter of funding, it's a matter of that institutionalized racism, that structural separation that inevitably leads to uh, a promotion of inferiority and among African-American students and superiority among white students, uh, neither of which is accurate. Um, so following Brown, uh, we have President Johnson's executive order almost a decade later. That's where we get the phrase affirmative action. And what he meant by that was that schools and workplaces actually had to show they were doing something, actually had to be showing they were taking active steps to uh, comply with these desegregation rulings. Um, and then again, three years later, we have Green versus New Kent County, that specific timetables have to be set and adhered to. And these are the decisions that set in motion desegregation um, in schools. And in the South, this is more successful because of the wordings of the Brown and Green decisions. Those wordings were targeted toward, and, but this is true of the 1964 Civil Rights Act as well, um, they were targeted to explicitly refer to legal structures of segregation where schools were concerned. In other words, laws that mandated separate school attendance by African American and white students. And in the South, that was a matter of removing those laws, and then often the schools were in close enough proximity that the physical act of integrating students, um, although certainly you know, not easy socially, uh, was geographically much easier to accomplish. Um, but it, it's no accident that the wording did not reflect that, what, that which would have been effective in the North. In other words, in the North, school segregation, at least not for the better part of the previous century, uh, was not the direct product of legislation related to schools. Um, it had its roots in location and economics, and while those don't sound like legislative issues, in fact, they are connected to legislation and to Supreme Court decisions. Um, so neither Brown nor the Civil Rights Act explicitly addressed this kind of segregation. Um, and so without really taking into account the relationship between the law, home ownership, wealth, and school attendance, schools in the North were inevitably going to remain segregated by race. Um, so one of the challenges when I engage with some of our partners in Japan, or really any other country, is helping them to understand that we don't have a school system in the United States. We have several thousand school systems. And that's a product of how our schools evolved historically. It was not a top-down decision. It came from the ground up. Uh, so when folks like Horace Mann and, and Louisa May Alcott were going around uh, Bronson Alcott going around and, and sort of getting the idea of schools that would be free at the point of delivery and paid for by the local communities, um, that creates the system that we've inherited today. And so, well, the federal government plays a very small role in the funding of schools in our country. Uh, the state a little bit more since NCLB, but not that much more. The lion's share of what funding schools receive is at the district and town level. And it depends on the district, depends on the state. You know, it's a little more complicated than this, but by and large, schools are dependent upon local property taxes for their funding. And then school governance is reflected the same way. The federal government really, other than Title IX and Title I, doesn't have a lot of jurisdiction over American schools. In fact, the Department of Education was created in my lifetime. It was 1979. Um, maybe 78. Um, so doesn't play a much, and, and the state, although again, since 19, since um, rather NCLB in 2001, uh, the state's played slightly greater role. Still, the lion's share of curriculum, structuring, hiring, enrollment, that's handled at the local level, at the district level. And it's handled by elected school boards, school committees. And so each school board has almost complete governance, although that practice, in practice that gets delegated out to other parties. And this is what we call the devil's bargain, right? Local control, local funding. You can construct that as, uh, okay, you want us to pay for these schools? Great, we get to control them. Or conversely, you want control over these schools? Great, you pay for it. And so this results in enormous variation 
in American schools in terms of what their structures are, what their curriculum is, uh, hiring and firing practices for teachers, all, and importantly, resources. So although everyone is guaranteed a free education at the point of delivery in the United States, uh, obviously I don't have to tell you that towns with a very large property tax base are able to have very well supplied schools that can attract very well qualified teachers. Um, and towns with a smaller tax base tend to have less well supplied, less well maintained schools. Um, and in most parts of the United States, you don't have a choice, right? Where you are living dictates where you are able to go to school. And there are certainly exceptions in terms of school choice programs and voucher programs, but by and large, it is uh, geography and district of residence that dictates the attendance of the vast majority of students in the United States. Um, in order to go to a school that has more in the way of resources, you have to go to uh, a different town and reside there. Um, and it is no accident that if you map school district borders to wealth, um, you can see there is immense economic segregation. And in the United States, economics and race always go hand in hand. So if you look across the country, although the, the nature of the gap um, is more dramatic in some parts than others, actually we're doing pretty well in Massachusetts comparatively. Um, but still, this results in schools that are these kind of apartheid schools that are majority minority schools. You will also find the least amount of resources. Uh, so 2016 was the most recent federal data I could find, and that spoke that the number of high poverty schools serving primarily black, and this is their language, I would not use this language, but black and students of color, um, more than doubled between 2001 and 2014. So this is not ancient history, this is ongoing. Something is happening now that is further increasing what is already a large divide um, in terms of race and economics in schooling. Um, and indeed, if you look at percentage of students at high poverty schools, it's not as if there are not white students attending schools that are high poverty. Um, often in many rural districts, this is the case. Um, but then you've got almost half of African American and Latino students who are at schools that are classified as high poverty. Um, so why is this and why has it been getting worse? So redlining and restrictive covenants um, have historically kept most African Americans from buying homes in high land value areas, thus cutting them off from access to high performing schools. So redlining uh, really from 1933 to 1973 um, was not a hidden process. This was policy um, in, the, in the Federal Housing Authority. So for the benefit of our, our one person who maybe does not own property um, yet, Right? Um, it is rare for someone to just open a briefcase of cash and pay for a house. Right? What, what do most people probably have to do? Get a mortgage. They gotta get, yeah, get a mortgage from a bank. And often that is governed through the auspices of the Federal Housing Authority. There are lots of forms you fill out that have that FHA seal. Um, and very consciously and very openly, um, the FHA spent those 40 years mapping out here are districts where we will not give loans to people of color. And here are districts where we will, and those districts where they will tended to be those in the least desirable uh, parts of cities and had the smallest tax base and thus can field the least well-supplied schools. Um, now this actually continues unofficially into the 90s, uh, but this was, this was, was government policy. Um, interestingly enough, because um, I always kind of bristle when I hear civil rights issues discussed as if they were kind of solely the province of the Democratic Party. Um, one of the biggest opponents of redlining was then Michigan Governor George Romney, uh, who was Republican and father of uh, present day Senator from Utah and former Mass Governor uh, Mitt Romney. So indeed it was not only uh, a liberal cause to, uh, to fight redlining. And so redlining was part of it. The other part was what we call race-based restrictive covenants. Um, these are agreements uh, between uh, property owners to not sell property to people, usually African-Americans, but sometimes Asian-Americans or Jews. Um, and so in 1917, uh, the Supreme Court decision Buchanan versus Worley um, outlawed state and town legislation that mandates racial-based zoning. However, 
A couple of years later, Corrigan versus Buckley upheld the fact that private zoning arrangements based on race were still legal. And they were until 1948. So again, this is a legally enforceable contract. If you fail to adhere to it, you risk forfeiting your property. Um, and they prohibit, again, the purchase, lease, or occupation, so you can't even rent, uh, of property uh, by a particular group of people. And it's enforced through property owners and real estate boards and neighborhood associations. Um, so by 1940, by the time the, you know, the decade rolls around where this is made illegal, 80% of property in many major metropolitan areas has already had this institutionalized exclusion. Um, so again, it's 1948, and then the Fair Housing Act reinforces it. But actually, some of these local covenants actually remain on the books until they're challenged. Right? A, a law is only good if people agree to follow it. And so I think the last one I could find was 2005, when someone actually came forward and said, hey, wait a minute, this thing is still there, and this was made illegal a long time ago. Um, but in areas where school segregation is not the direct product of school-related legislation, when it's the product of redlining, restrictive covenants, location, economics, um, then neither the Brown decision nor the Civil Rights Act uh, explicitly addresses this kind of segregation. Um, and so what winds up happening is, uh, this is 1971 Swan versus Charlotte Mecklenburg, um, which is significant because one of the biggest undoings of desegregation comes back to Charlotte Mecklenburg, that's a little bit later. But in 1971, there's a unanimous Supreme Court decision that forced busing can be a tool to address segregation in places like the North, where you're not talking about laws that are explicitly saying students of different races have to attend different schools, but rather it's the price of all of these other laws and decisions that are not explicitly school related. And so busing is uh, a tool that is then presented uh, for potential use. Um, however, very shortly afterwards, you've got 1974 Milken versus Bradley, and this is a split decision, but it rules that desegregation cannot cross district lines, which essentially renders busing a useless tool outside of a major metropolitan area. And so if you've heard the expression white flight, White uh, property owners who did not wish to live in an integrated district could simply change residence, move out to the suburbs, um, and then be protected, so to speak, by those restrictive covenants, by the history of redlining. Um, busing really did not uh, address racial uh, dynamics in schools beyond the borders of a given community. So busing becomes a remedy really only within the borders of large cities and cities that uh, wind up proposing and implementing busing as the result of lawsuits um, that these cities were not in compliance with the Brown decision um, include Boston and Springfield right here, uh, Kansas City, Las Vegas, Los Angeles, uh, Wilmington. And by and large, these busing orders wind up being swiftly overturned. Uh, so for example, in New York City, um, actually the largest single boycott or walkout in US history, 460,000 students in 1964 uh, walk out of their schools um, protesting the segregated uh, nature of New York schools. Um, the demands include zoning, uh, rezoning school districts uh, to promote integration. Um, and then the next month, there is a counter protest of 15,000 white New Yorkers uh, who march across the Brooklyn Bridge. And their rhetoric is not explicitly race-based, but what they go on to uh, defend is what they call the right to attend a neighborhood school. And that winds up being enshrined in New York. And that's why busing never really takes hold because even prior to the 71 decision, the idea of a right to attend a neighborhood school is something that's a part of New York, and I'm, I'm not sure it's coincidence then that New York remains the most segregated uh, school, state, state with the most segregated schools today. Um, in California, um, 1979, after a couple of years of busing, uh, voters pass, I'm not sure all the voters were white, but it was certainly something championed by a number of white voters, passed Constitutional Proposition 1 uh, to put a stop to federally mandated busing. Um, the argument was that Brown required school desegregation only in situations where segregation had resulted from intentional acts on the part of school system officials. And they were right, because that's how Brown was phrased. 
And so it took a couple years, but 1982, Crawford versus Board of Ed of City of Los Angeles uh, basically said mandatory busing cannot be a thing. Um, we'll take a couple of minutes to look at Boston because Boston is actually the city where um, busing resulted in the most violent protests. Um, and so this comes out of a 1972 uh, federal court suit where uh, parents of African-American students um, successfully sued the city of Boston for, again, failure to comply with Brown. And so Judge uh, Arthur Garrity, who is a judge from Wellesley, uh, so he is not affected by this decision, um, orders uh, court-mandated desegregation of schools through busing. And I'm going to play about 10 minutes of footage from uh, the documentary series Eyes on the Prize. I don't know if anyone here has watched that. It's a great series. Um, and for me, this is a reminder that as a white person, this was not a part of my education, even though I grew up about two hours from Boston. It was never mentioned in my schools. And if not for the fact that my dad had lived through it, um, I'm not sure I would have known. Uh, so watching this footage for me is, is strange on many levels um, and upsetting on different levels. Um, so I've kind of spliced together a couple of, of different clips um, explaining the genesis of the lawsuit um, and the actions of busing and then the, the violent protests against it. A growing number of parents and teachers were complaining about conditions in the school. Here I was, a brand new teacher, coming into my first teaching experience, and I walked into this old building built in 1842, named after a wonderful New England writer, Louise May Alcott, and I had 42 students, 36 seats. We didn't have new crayons, we had a box of old number crayons. Pencils had to be collected at the end of the day so you would have enough for the children for the next day. There wasn't enough white paper. Books were often in short supply. Many of the Negro parents believe that a predominantly Negro school is inferior per se, but we in here in Boston do not believe that premise. Louise Day Hicks said that the schools were fine the way they were. The city's top vote getter in the mid 60s, Hicks chaired the Boston School Committee. In 1965, one in four students was black. Only one in 200 teachers was black and there was not one black principal. The NAACP brought parents' concerns to the school committee. I feel that at this time, any school that is predominantly Negro is an inadequate school. I didn't hear what you said, Mrs. Johnson. I said that any school that is predominantly Negro in Boston is an inadequate school. But Mrs. Johnson, the superintendent of schools, has stated as his policy that a racially imbalanced school is not educationally harmful. Well, uh, Mrs. Hicks, may, uh, Madam Chairman, may I say this? Superintendent Orenberger and yourself and other committee members do not have children in a racially imbalanced school, so you do not know what the effect is on our children. <laughs> The statement that we made to the school committee said that where there were a majority of black students, there was not concern for how these kids learned, that there were crowded classrooms, temporary teachers, not enough books, and supplies were low, and all of that kind of thing. Even physical conditions were poor. Community activists could not force the school committee to acknowledge a problem. So, all that brains, I think it just means being some uh, goodwill and some common sense. Parents responded with a variety of strategies throughout the mid-60s. They organized one-day school boycotts and freedom schools, but short-term protest was not enough. They ran candidates for the school committee, but they lost. They pushed through a state law outlawing racially imbalanced schools, but the school committee refused to enforce it. Own hands. Some set up voluntary programs that moved children to empty seats in white schools. Decided the genesis in that, that we can talk where about that a there better. were a large number of white students, that's where the care went, that's where the books went, that's where the money went. So therefore, our theory was move our kids into the school where they're putting all of the resources so that they can get a better education. Other parents took a different approach. 
Instead of working to integrate white schools, they establish their own parent-run independent schools. Does anybody have any questions? No. The black community could not afford to transport all its students to white schools, nor to run its own school system. The battle for quality education would have to be fought in the public schools. On June 21, 1974, Federal District Court Judge W. Arthur Garrity ruled that the Boston School Committee was guilty of consciously maintaining two separate school systems, one black, one white. He ordered an immediate remedy, citywide busing, to start in September. Less than a mile separated two of Boston's poorer neighborhoods. Roxbury was the heart of the black community. South Boston was Louise Day Hicks' home and a center of white risk. So the choice of which communities to approach was also, was motivated by, by a great many things. Um, one was that Arthur Garrity really did not like Louise Day Hicks and picks her district. But also, this was the district where the white residents had the least amount of wealth and political capital. Um, initially, East Boston had been the choice, and there was enough pushback um, that South Boston was chosen instead. And so the, the community targeted to be the first white community to be involved in busing was a community that um, itself was in some ways uh, subject to oppression in terms of economics, which again is very different than racial oppression, but certainly constructed themselves as victims. And there is a, uh, a great book, Michael Patrick McDonald's All Souls, uh, which sort of gives a very compelling perspective from South Boston residents. Um, but ultimately, kind of the choice of this district um, in some ways was setting things up for, for what we see next. Systems. Students were to be bused between the two neighborhoods. When Gandhi's decision came down in June of 1974, we were sunk when we heard some of the remedies, the one of busing to South Boston, because those of us who had lived in Boston all of our lives knew that this was going to be a very, very difficult thing to pull off. With the opening of school only 12 weeks away, political differences among blacks gave way to shared concern for the safety of the children. Just because I'm white doesn't mean that the 14th Amendment doesn't, doesn't require me either. I am white and I want my rights. Demonstrators had come to the federal building to protest Senator Edward Kennedy's support of desegregation. His family had always been the pride of Boston's Irish community. But now, the crowd turned on Kennedy. Those people out there don't care to listen to you. The crowd pursued Kennedy to the doors of the federal building. September 12, 1974. Under court order, against school committee wishes, the integration of Boston schools began. It was a quiet first day of school in Roxbury, as it was in most of the city. black parents waited inside to greet the few white students who came to Roxbury High School. But across town, crowds of whites had been gathering outside South Boston High School since early morning. 
school's headmaster had been at South Boston High for nine years. Let's go, gentlemen. Come on. Get in You can tell us to leave, then we can tell kids not to go to school. Come on, let's go. Go to school. Come on. 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 students absent. At the end of the school day, more trouble waited outside. On the evening news, Bostonians saw school buses being attacked as they left South Boston. White supposed to busing took heart from Gerald Ford's first press conference as president. I have consistently opposed uh, forced busing to achieve racial balance as a solution to quality education. And therefore, I respectfully disagree, disagree with the judge's uh, order. Boston was left on its own. The city's neighborhoods grew even more isolated and hostile. South Boston, December 11th, 1974. A fight at the high school between a black and a white student got out of hand. I remember the day Michael Faith got stabbed um, vividly because um, I was in the principal's office and all of a sudden you heard a lot of commotion and you heard kids screaming and yelling saying he's dead, he's dead, that black nigga killed him, he's dead, he's dead. Oh geez, it was, we were close enough that we saw there was blood, you know, on the hallway floor. White students left, rumors spread. South Boston residents and others surrounded the school. The black students were trapped inside. closer to the school, we, we could hear the noise and it's like a hollow feeling when you go up that hill. Finally, it must have been 2.30 or 3 o'clock that afternoon, all of a sudden all you heard was, um, you're going out the back door, you're going out the back door. At that moment, we had to run to the buses. While the decoy buses distracted the mob at the front of the school, other buses pulled up to the back. The black students and leaders made it out of South Boston safely. Michael Faith did not die, but his stabbing and the ensuing riot further polarized the city. So 
while those were the scenes that, let me rephrase. Um, so while those scenes portray the, the far more common phenomenon of white crowds uh, protesting often violently against the inclusion of black students in their schools, the media was showing very different pictures, particularly the, uh, the entertainment media. Um, so this is one film uh, called Halls of Anger, which essentially was a scare piece. Jeff Bridges, um, actually in one of his early roles, uh, stars as a white student who is being bused to a uh, predominantly black school and winds up having to somehow defend himself against harm there. And I'll just show you part of the preview for it, although it's kind of, where'd it go? A handful of white students are transferred to an all black school. You know there's gonna be trouble. Vanilla ice cream. And I'm gonna take me a big lick. They favor busing the taxi. So this sort of white fear of integration causing a lack of safety uh, kind of runs in encounter to the actual phenomenon of the African-American students' safety being at risk during integration. And so this narrative, however, persists and winds up coming out in forms of, we don't want our school plagued by violence, white parents would say. And that winds up sort of permeating the narratives in the 70s, moving into the 80s and 90s, when two key Supreme Court decisions basically say that it's no longer the Supreme Court's jurisdiction to govern uh, school desegregation attempts, that federal and lower courts can now make those calls. Um, and so once that door is open, um, we start to see a lot of decisions that basically have states taking into their own hands uh, acts to end desegregation. And in the same place that the Swan decision happened, which was the decision that, uh, lit that allowed forced busing as an integration option, um, now we're back in Charlotte-Mecklenburg, um, there was a uh, kind of busing success story in Charlotte in that, again, being part of the, the formerly segregated South, the, the remedies that were more legally grounded in school policy were addressed, busing was used, and by the 90s, it was one of the most racially integrated school districts in the US. Um, in 1999, there was a particular white parent who sued the district because his daughter did not get lottery pick for her top choice. And he said that, look, the fact that the district had a policy that grew out of uh, the Brown decision and grew out of the Civil Rights Act that uh, main, that schools would have to maintain a 60% white and 40% black ratio reflecting the makeup of the district. He said the fact that there were separate lotteries for black and white students was a violation of the Equal Protection Clause, which is interesting, right? Because that was the key in Brown used by the African-American plaintiffs. Now we have white plaintiffs saying, look, we are being disadvantaged now. You shouldn't be using race uh, as, a, uh, as a determinant, even though looking again at that map of wealth as mapped to school district as mapped to race, um, certainly in the aggregate, uh, white families were far more able to access uh, high quality schools. But we have key lower court decisions coming out, the federal court and then the appeals court afterwards um, in South Carolina upholds the fact that race cannot be used as a factor in school admissions. And that winds up leading to a chain reaction of other state decisions. I'll focus back again in Massachusetts. So in 1997, uh, we had sort of a similar situation uh, with Boston Latin School. We had a uh, parent of a white student suing based on uh, admissions policies that took race into account, uh, leading to a school committee vote in 99 to end race as a basis for school assignment. Um, and then in 2012, uh, we have Mayor Menino uh, essentially presiding over the end of the zone system, the end of even keeping formal track of these are districts where there is racial imbalance and we have to rezone it. So again, through legislation, through court decisions, through mayoral decisions, 
we see the continued unraveling of even what elements of Brown were being enforced. Um, so between 99 and 2009, this winds up happening across the country. State after state after state winds up striking down any kind of school policy that uses race as a component. Um, so that's school policy. What about voluntary programs? So you saw very briefly mentioned in the Eyes on the Prize piece, you know, METCO was created as a voluntary program in 1966. Um, still in existence today, it's kind of looked at as a national model. Um, and it's very interesting the way that the Metco legislation is written out. And one of the authors was a state senator who was the father of a former guidance counselor at uh, Concord Carlisle, Dr. Tom Curtin. Um, his father was one of the key architects of Metco legislation. Um, and Metco, interestingly, the law is written that the program is supposed to address both racial imbalance and something called racial isolation. In other words, racial imbalance when more than 50% of your students in a school are non-white. In Boston today is about 85% non-white population in schools, even though the population in Boston is about 50% non-white. The schools are, again, highly segregated. Um, but also racial isolation. That Massachusetts classifies certain schools as being in a state of racial isolation when fewer than 30% of students are non-white. And CCRSD, last time I checked, is 16% non-white. So this district qualifies as a district in racial isolation. So one of the interesting things about framing it that way is framing segregated schools as something that is harmful not only to African-American students, not only to students of color, but to white students as well. That there is, and again, you can, you know, at your leisure, or if you get bored, um, look here to, to various studies um, that talk about the negative effects of segregated schools on white students. And so the METCO legislation is written with that conscious appeal. Um, other states, not so much. Um, so Seattle had a similar program. 2007 winds up uh, coming to the Supreme Court. Um, again, on the grounds that race is being used as a factor in a program that is involved with the schools. Um, so a 5-4 decision uh, from the Supreme Court in 2007 uh, says that schools cannot implement voluntary desegregation efforts um, in that they violate the 14th Amendment because they propose a policy based on race. And again, cities cannot voluntarily consider race as a tool to integrate at schools in the absence of a finding of discrimination by a federal court which is what saves Boston, it's what saves Metco, because of that Garrity decision. But in the absence of that decision, and there were not always those kinds of decisions in every state, then suddenly even voluntary programs of the ilk of Metco become illegal. So in other words, if Seattle schools had been resisting a court desegregation order, then the court could have ordered it to, continue to consider race but it was not allowed to act on its own as a school district to voluntarily remedy segregation. Um, and this sets up the precedent that any consideration of race, no matter how benign or inclusive in the words of Justice Roberts, is presumptively unconstitutional. So again, I wanna keep bringing us back to that idea that we are not in a state of de facto segregation. We're in a state of de jure segregation. This comes out of developments that have been a consistent stream since Brown and then extend into our decade as well. Um, so because of all the benefits of integrated schools, not just for students of color, but also for white students, um, it's still in the interests of students across the country to actually fulfill that promise of integration. And so rather than succumbing to that comforting, perhaps if you're white and don't experience it directly, narrative that Brown ended segregation, if efforts were focused on, okay, how do we actually end segregation? There are actually a number of different models that various folks propose that uh, have their pros and cons. And again, I'll make sure I'm respecting time, good. Um, so uh, one model, uh, particularly favored by, by conservatives in America is school choice. Um, the pitch is that, well, if you have more charter schools, more magnet schools, more vouchers, then you've got options for parents. You are not bound by the uh, the, the district limits necessarily uh, that you have to go to this particular school because this is where you live. So it does attempt to address that fundamental driver of inequity in American public schooling. And it has the advantage in terms of complying with law that race doesn't need to be a part of the conversation. 
you can uh, theoretically, regardless of race, apply to these schools and it's a lottery. Um, the challenge is, well, a limited number of slots are available in the most well-resourced schools, and the most vulnerable children who have parents who don't have the necessary financial capital or linguistic capital or political capital to really kind of take advantage of the system are still at a disadvantage. And again, because that tracks so much with race, it still results in a racial imbalance in terms of students with access to to some of these choice schools. Uh, so model number two, if that's sort of the conservative fantasy, this is the liberal fantasy, which is the Nordic model. My, my daughter suggested the picture. Um, <laughs> so again, in Finland and other Nordic countries and to a lesser extent in other places in Europe, education is viewed as a child's right. and It's the government's responsibility to supply the means to that uh, education, high quality, equitable schools. The theory being in a society where all schools are excellent, then all children are served equally regardless of race or socioeconomics. Uh, the challenge is, is this would be a fundamental reshaping of the way public education has always worked in the United States. It would require a federal level organization of the schools and funding of the schools. And that is radically different from the way our system has always been. Um, and so, that presents a, a rather large challenge. Um, so another model um, is open enrollment. In other words, the same system we have now, but now all schools in a district or even in a state would be open enrollment and accessible to anyone. So theoretically, you could grow up in Springfield, but go to school in Lexington or vice versa. Um, in some ways, this is in some ways how the system in Japan works. It's a little more complicated than that. Um, so this eliminates the trap of wedding schooling to your neighborhood or zip code um, there wouldn't be any changes necessary for the schools themselves or funding structures. It appeals to the idea that competition between schools will somehow raise the quality of all schools because they're competing for students. Um, the challenges, of course, is that you still have those seat limitations um, at the most well-resourced schools. And transportation costs money. So either the families are footing that bill themselves to drive across the state, um, which again will wind up differentially affecting families based on economics and race, which are so very linked so often, uh, or this is going to require investment from the state in funding the transportation. Um, and this could still result in white flight um, if the image again is of that, oh gosh, what happens when you, you know, mix the schools, are white children in danger somehow now, like in that movie we saw, um, then indeed this could put theoretically send us right back to where we were. Uh, two more models. Uh, one is the reserve slots model. Um, this is something New York is presently trying. Uh, I think they began it in just last year or 2017, which is, okay, find the schools that are highest performing and most well-resourced, and then reserve a certain number of spots in those schools for low-income or historically underserved minority students. Now again, this still potentially runs afoul of the you can't use race. However, states like New York and like Massachusetts, since you've got those federal court rulings on the books, some states could take advantage of this. Um, and then, you know, white kids and parents get to stay in privileged schools, students of color get a guaranteed chance to join them, theoretically everyone wins, and if some schools became larger, well, hey, the money travels with the students so you could hire more teachers and maintain ratios. Um, the challenge is, is that this can lead to segregation within the schools. If you look to some of the rare schools in uh, Massachusetts that are more racially balanced schools like Cambridge Ridge and Latin, schools like Brookline High School, you'll find that when it comes to uh, the more advanced honors, AP, whatever you want to label them, classes, there is, again, a separation by race. So this could result in segregation within a school, um, and you could still have white parental pushback for all the reasons we've talked about. And finally, this is number five. There was a piece in The Atlantic, I think last year, that just sort of raised my eyebrow and I wanted to include in this, uh, which is harness the power of college pressure. And so this was a thought piece that said, what if colleges take the demographics of schools into account? In other words, not affirmative action, which is we are taking certain students based on race, but priority to applicants who attend schools that have a certain threshold of low income students. So in other words, you could be a white student at Concord Carlisle, but if Concord Carlisle were a more diverse school than whether you were white or African American or Latino or Asian, you would have an advantage because you're coming from a more integrated school. And so admissions officers would look favorably upon students from those schools, and this would exert pressure on those schools to integrate, and it would incentivize white parents not to flee for wider districts because then they might be at a competitive disadvantage. Um, 
obviously, number one, this requires voluntary participation by a great number of universities. Um, and number two, given the prohibitive price of college, this might only incentivize parents in particularly um, well-off or at least middle class um, white districts, uh, white parents for whom college, for whatever reasons, might not be on the radar for their children, would not necessarily see an incentive for this model to integrate their schools. So that's the quickie 55 minute version um, of why Brown is not the end, should not be the end of our conversation about uh, segregation integration in schools. Um, so much has happened through legislation and through judicial decisions that have maintained and exacerbated segregation. But again, I think that gives us hope or can give us hope that therefore there are potential political, legal, and judicial remedies. Um, we are not in a state of de facto segregation. We're in a state of segregation that derives from political decisions that can be made differently. And uh, I will stop talking because I've been talking for a long time and I would love to just step back and whenever time you want to devote, would love to hear your thoughts about anything from the last hour. Um, for the one where it's like, the, I think it's the fifth option where um, colleges would give preference to people who had gone to diverse schools. Um, first of all, like, who came up with that idea? Um, <laughs> like, was it a college that said that, or was that like oh, someone? Yeah. You've got me. I'm, I I should have the name of the. If you if you give me a second, I've 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 got it bookmarked. If you give me a second, I can get the name of the the author of that piece. Let's hold on one sec because it is good practice to always ask, what's your source? <laughs> well, no, I was just wondering if like, colleges would be willing to do that. Like if it had been, like, I don't know, the head of a college saying that that should be a That is an excellent question, and give me a second to find that piece. Mm -hmm. well, so, somewhat related to that, I, I, my children started school in, in New Jersey that has um, kind of a different, had, it, had a very different approach to trying to improve the funding status of schools, not the busing, not to, not to try to work on racial imbalances or racial isolation, but to make sure that schools in disadvantaged areas were just as well endowed and had the same equipment. They were called Abbott schools. And so um, a certain amount of every local municipalities tax property tax revenue went to elizabeth newark camden um, to try to rectify those differences um, but again because of the legal limits on trying to integrate the schools parents who wanted to make a voluntary choice to get the benefits of desegregation for their children sent their kids to private schools that were more racially integrated. Interesting. And you know, it was a real dilemma as a parent because you live in a community that had, on paper, good public schools, but you knew that they were missing something. And um, ironic. And and and, again, and also living in San Francisco before New Jersey, where the race issue was more Asian versus European. Again, the same. It was interesting when you said the timing of those decisions because it completely um, was consistent with um, taking race explicitly out of the um, quota system in, in seats in the schools, so much so that the really high performing schools that were in the Asian neighborhoods wanted, the Asian neighborhoods actually wanted to secede from the city of San Francisco so that they could have continued representation in their own neighborhood schools and not be forced through actually what was the open enrollment model. Every single seat in every single public school in San Francisco was by lottery. Not any, there was no, by the time our kids were the age for school, there wasn't any, you know, live in this neighborhood, walk your kid to school. And did, did we move away? from a white flight, I, I mean, I don't know, but it was really hard to imagine that, you know, you'd have kids two years apart in school and they wouldn't be in the same school. And certainly as a parent, you know, I don't want to demonize parents who are acting in what they feel is the best interest of their children. I mean, certainly I can empathize. Um, 
it's wrapped up, of course, in this kind of much right. larger system. Um, so the author is Rachel Cohen, and she is identified as a journalist for the Washington Post, or a journalist in Washington, D.C., rather. So, and this is uh, 2018. So if you want to find the Atlantic article, I could even email it to you if you want. Um, May 23rd, 2018 was the article. Um, problem like I see like a lot of issues here um, the first one would be that you know if uh, people that were born into the neighborhood where you know a lot of people didn't go to college and don't make a lot of money they cannot afford buying the house in Concord so that's kind of like a first obstacle for them that uh, even though in theory uh, they can buy the house here. The laws that prevented them from buying uh, the house in a white neighborhood is, you know, it's not allowed anymore. But they are prevented by economic situation. So um, the second thing is like if we were able to improve the schools in those neighborhood, and then more of those kids would be able to go to college and have better jobs, then they would be the first generations that could buy the houses in Concord, and kind of their kids would be growing up here. So there's just like, it seems to me there's just like so many ways that it needs to be tackled to improve it that like, you know, approaching it just from like kind of one angle is not going to solve it very quickly because they can't have a, you know, a well-paid job that will allow them to buy the house in an expensive neighborhood. Um, so it seems so that's to be that's affordable housing um, efforts are so important in all communities, right? Because if you get, you know, that allows people to, you know, but that's difficult to do. What are, the, what are the things that, sorry? Oh, I was just going to say, uh, I know that Concord had like, put up a, like, a act where they would have a tax when you were selling houses to try and pay for four lives. Right. Like Concord, I don't know, did it that pass? It did pass. It did oh, it did? Okay. I wasn't aware of that. I, mean, I, I do find interesting, you know, because it gets back to the original Brown arguments about, you know, what what is the best remedy for an unequal school system? Is it to ensure, you know, strong funding for all schools, mm -hmm. and then kind of that rising tide will lift all boats? That was certainly a line of argument. What interests me about Brown is that the Brown decision said even that would not address the real issue. That the issue is the separation. That theoretically, even if you had a school system that was as well resourced as CC, um, but was majority minority, that that would have still harmful effects upon those minority students. And then interestingly, the, the METCO legislation talks about having harmful effects on the white students in the racially isolated schools too. Mm -hmm. So it's been interesting for me to kind of wrestle with that in my mind. Um, is it solely a matter of socioeconomics, or is there something entirely separate about race that also needs to be addressed that goes beyond just socioeconomics? And it's something I'm still wrestling with, but you know, in, in, in my research for this talk, that wasn't something I was aware of before, and seeing that was such a key piece in Brown um, has been- It calls into question um, historically black colleges and universities, Women's colleges, which I attended and am a strong proponent of as a way of getting women to feel empowered and not second class citizens. But you know, these are these are intentional separations, and they've even done um, in private schools where they can do this. They have had math classes that were just girls, so and found that the girls that were in just female math classes stuck with it and did much better than girls that were in co-ed math classes. And this is through middle school and high school where they were, didn't have the stigma. And, and in fact, you know, there are studies that talk about with race as well. Teresa Perry, for example, writes, you know, in her argument, integration was the worst thing that could have happened to African-American students because it brought them into continual contact with a majority white system of schools that continually uh, fed them with messages of inferiority right. in a way that I think she kind of romanticizes the Negro schools, but she does talk about kind of the, the achievement mindset that was present in so many of them. So she's sort of, in some ways, making that argument that, you know, maybe 
integration is not the magic solution to everything so long as there are such disparities in terms of, of privilege and power. So it's, it's quite a rabbit hole that, that one can go down, but I think it's one that we've got to go down. One of the things that's really striking about Boston and New York in particular is that they're not poorly funded schools. So it's not, it's too simple to say like, oh, the, you know, the majority black schools or the poor schools, those are not, neither is a poor city school. They're just wildly mismanaged. And it's, it's hard to parse that if, if they could be. I mean, one wants to hope that people are so competitive for their children, they wouldn't go, they, I feel like there are parent populations who would choose competitive schools over any other factor, race, etc. And if, I, I don't know why these two particular, in Chicago as well, these two, three metropolitan, really well-funded massive metropolitan schools are so, I mean, I think they're almost too big to succeed, right? When you think about what it takes to run schools and how can you run these gigantor things well. But, but that's what always amazes me, is that Boston is not a poor school. They have a massive tax base. They have funds out their ears, and yet you still do have overpopulated, undersupplied, classrooms I, I I I feel like you know solution number six might be like untangling that mess so that people didn't fly anywhere I don't know that seems really simplistic I'm sure that Boston does choose to make a disproportionate investment in like the exam schools for example yes which wind up getting many more resources and yes and then also have a disparate there the exam school ratio race ratio does not reflect the rest of BPS at all. So it's really, it's hard. So but thank, thank you. you. Hope thank you, you so much. Talk about this some more. And I really appreciate you all coming out. Thank you.